That guy over there, the one digging into his lunch, he's Steve Roberts, a real sharp steering and front end man. In just a moment, his lunch is going to be interrupted. Watch. Hi, Steve. Say, could you spare a few minutes? I got a problem, and I sure could use your help. Mm -hmm. Sure. What's your trouble, Chuck? It's my kid brother, Steve. He's wild about cars, wants to know all about them. I've had no trouble explaining things so far, but last night he said he'd like to know more about steering and front-end design. Frankly, I'm a little rusty on the whys and wherefores of Castor and Camber, so... So you'd like to review steering geometry and how it affects handling. <laughs> okay, I guess I can't let you look bad in your brother's eyes. And to begin with, there are five basic factors affecting steering geometry. Camber, caster, toe-in, steering axis inclination, toe-out on turns. The first three factors are adjustable. The last two are not but we measure them to detect damaged parts. Whatever you do, stick to the approved front-end alignment specifications. They are engineered to give the most satisfactory steering and handling. Right, Tech. Those specs are your best insurance for customer satisfaction. Now, what do you know about camber, Chuck? Well, I know that it's the amount that the front wheels are tilted in or out as you look at the car from the front. When the top of the wheel leans out, away from the car, it's called positive camber. When it leans in, it's called negative camber. But it seems to me that you'd get the most even tire wear with the wheel perfectly straight up. So why have camber at all? That's a good question, Chuck. Actually, zero camber would be best for average running on straight level roads. But in everyday driving, we've got other conditions to consider, too. For example, let's see what happens when a car rounds a curve. Centrifugal force puts added weight on the outside wheel. And, of course, the car body tends to move downward very slightly at the outside wheel. And whenever the body moves downward or the wheel moves upward, the relative wheel movement is called jounce. Now, as the car body moves down over the outside wheel, the top of the wheel moves inward because of the control arm geometry engineered into the suspension system. Is that camber change in jounce important? Uh, you bet it is, Chuck. In jounce, the tire is tilted so that it bites in and braces the tread against side-slipping toward the outside of the turn. Camber change at the outside wheel is important on crowned roads, too. Tell Chuck why, Steve. Well, Chuck, on a crowned road, there's more weight on the low wheel. It goes into jounce and leans uphill. And because it leans uphill, it tries to roll in that direction. This helps offset the tendency of the car to drift toward the side of the road. What happens when a wheel moves down or the body moves up? The upward movement of the car body, or a corresponding downward movement of the wheel, is called rebound. The control arms are designed so that, in rebound, there's little or no change in camber. The entire wheel just moves sideways a bit. This feature of negative camber in jounce and no camber change, or just a little positive camber in rebound, contributes a lot to the excellent handling and cornering characteristics of our cars. Be sure to point that out to your brother, Chuck. I sure will, Tech, but tell me, why isn't the same camber specified for both front wheels? Because all roads aren't flat. Some of them are crowned. Less positive camber is specified for the right wheel to compensate for crowned roads. If camber is appreciably off specifications, you may get hard steering, wander, and abnormal tire wear. And an excessive difference between left and right wheel camber can contribute to a shimmy at low speeds. Well, you guys sure have filled me in on the subject of camber. I hope you can do the same with the rest of the five factors. We'll try, Chuck. Let's talk about caster next. Caster is the forward or backward tilt of the steering axis of the front wheels. If the steering axis leans toward the rear, caster is positive. If it leans forward, caster is negative. Steering axis is just a new name for what we used to call kingpin axis before ball joints replaced the kingpin. A furniture caster shows what effect caster has on steering. When you push the furniture, the caster wheel trails directly behind the pivot. I see. The pivot leads the wheel and pulls the wheel behind it exactly in line with the direction you're pushing. Right. And if you drew a center line through the pivot to the floor, it would be in front of the point where the wheel touches the floor. That's an example of positive caster. The front wheel of your brother's bicycle has positive caster for directional stability, Chuck. 
You could use that as an example, too. Sure, and I could show them that the same principle applies to a car with positive caster. When the steering axis points to the road ahead of the center of tire contact, it pulls the wheel straight behind it. And positive caster not only adds to a car's directional stability, it also makes the front wheels return faster after a turn. But remember, positive caster increases steering effort. Positive caster is used with power steering to give good returnability and directional stability. The higher steering effort's no problem because the power steering does most of the work. That makes sense. But why do we have negative caster with manual steering? To reduce steering effort, Chuck. With a manual gear, a slight amount of negative caster is specified. Not enough to seriously reduce stability, though. That's because today's cars actually get more directional stability from steering axis inclination than they do from caster. The steering axis isn't vertical. It's slanted or inclined inward at the top. The angle between the steering axis and the wheel spindle is slightly more than 90 degrees. Now, when the front wheel is turned, the spindle turns about the steering axis. But because this angle is over 90 degrees, the spindle tilts slightly downward as the wheel is turned away from the straight ahead position. The wheel won't let the outer end of the spindle move downward, so the steering knuckle tends to lift the control arms and that side of the car as well. The more the spindle is turned, the greater the lifting tendency. Or, looking at it another way, car weight will naturally resist the lifting tendency and try to keep the steering knuckle at its lowest point. And this point is reached when the spindle is straight out from the car and the wheel is in the straight ahead position. I see. Car weight always tries to make the spindles point straight out and keep the wheels pointed straight down the road. You got the idea, Chuck. Actually, this force isn't strong enough to cause hard steering, but it's sufficient to give excellent directional stability in all our cars. Steering axis inclination isn't adjustable. It's designed into the car. You can assume that it's okay if camber can be adjusted to specifications. It's not necessary to measure it unless you're trying to detect damaged parts. Well, Steve, you certainly answered some of my questions. But tell me, do these fundamentals have any practical use in your everyday work? Oh, very definitely, Chuck. For example, if a manual steering car has positive caster, it'll cause hard steering. Now, here are some more thumb rules for diagnosing the effects of incorrect caster on steering and handling. With power steering, too much positive caster can cause a low-speed shimmy and wander at higher speeds. You'll feel a lot more road shock at the steering wheel, too. With unequal caster, the car will drift to the side with least caster. Then, when the brakes are applied, the wheel with least caster tries to turn out and the car pulls to that side. And the worst condition is when there's negative caster at one wheel and positive caster at the other. So you see, Chuck, there are two sides to this steering geometry story. It can help you in your job as well as making you look good in your brother's eyes. Yeah, and this story's not the only thing with two sides. This record's got another side, too. Well, Steve, you've given me a pretty good idea of how camber, caster, and steering axis inclination affect handling. I picked up some service tips, too, but there are two other factors you haven't covered yet. That's right, Chuck. So let's take toe-in next. As you know, toe-in is the amount that the front wheels are closer together at the extreme front of the tires than they are at the rear. If the wheels are closer at the rear than at the front, it's called toe-out. I've heard that if you have too much camber, you can increase toe-in to offset the tendency of the wheels to turn out and roll in a circle. Whoa there, Chuck. That's not so. Two wrongs don't make a right. That goes double for suspension specs. In actual operation, zero toe with the wheels neither towing in nor towing out is always best, regardless of camber. That's true, Tech. The two front wheels should run parallel. But to obtain a running toe of zero, there's got to be just a bit of toe in when the car is at rest to offset a tendency of the wheels to turn outward because of tread drag and braking forces. That's important because toe out causes wander. To avoid toe out under running conditions, a slight amount of toe in is specified. Even when toe in is set correctly, it doesn't take much looseness in the steering linkage to let the wheels actually toe out under running conditions. 
That's why it's useless to try to adjust toe-in on a car with loose tie rod ends, steering linkage, or wheel bearings. Always make sure that the tie rod ball studs are centered in their sockets. This will ensure free movement of the ball studs when the wheels are turned and when the front suspension moves up and down on rough roads. Now here's the easiest way to make sure the ball studs are centered. Loosen both tie rod end clamps. Rotate both ball sockets in the same direction until they bottom against the ball studs. Tighten the clamps while holding the ends in this position. Just make sure the clamps are down so they won't interfere with anything. But let's get back on the subject of steering geometry. When the front wheels are turned, another factor enters the picture. It's called toe out on turns. Now I'm sure you know that on any turn, the wheel on the inside of the turn must be turned more than the one on the outside, since it has to turn in a tighter circle. The sharper the turn, the more the wheels toe out. Sure, that figures. But how is this done, Steve? It's designed into the steering linkage, Chuck. Notice that the steering arms angle in toward each other. Because of this, the amount that each wheel is turned for a given amount of tie rod movement is not the same. That's because the ends of the two steering arms travel through different portions of their arcs. Better give me that a little slower. Okay, Chuck. In a left turn, the left steering arm is pulled through that part of its arc where tie rod movement turns the arm a great deal. Now, in contrast, the right steering arm is pushed through a part of its arc that gives less turning for the same amount of tie rod movement. This is toe out on a left turn. Consequently, the left wheel, which is the inside wheel in this case, is turned more than the right one. In a right turn, of course, the situation is reversed and the right wheel is turned more. This produces the necessary right turn toe out. Speaking of turns, Chuck, remember this. All of these factors we've talked about do a lot to give our cars their exceptional cornering characteristics. Right, Tech. But believe it or not, this outstanding cornering ability can sometimes create problems. Once in a while, you'll get an owner who likes to make turns at too high at speed. That's easy to do in our cars, but it causes tire wear that can be mistaken for camber or toe wear. The only cure is to convince the driver to slow down by showing him how he's grinding off the tread, particularly at the outside shoulder. Well, Chuck, I think we've covered steering geometry fundamentals pretty well. You sure have. Thanks to you guys, I'm going to be a great success as a big brother. Seriously, I always had an idea those fractional specs for caster, camber, and toe-in were too fussy. Now I know why they're important. And I do appreciate those steering diagnosis thumb rules. Got any more good steering service tips? Well, here's one that affects braking. Some cases of brake pull can be traced to a loose control arm strut, so be sure it's tightened to the correct torque at both ends. Check the condition of the rubber bushing, too. I suppose that's because a loose strut allows a change in caster angle. Exactly, Chuck. Now, as you know, some of the 62 models will be coming in for their 32,000-mile ball joint lubrication. Just be sure you use the approved multi-mileage lubricant and a low-pressure gun. And be careful. Too much pressure and lube could damage the seals. Here's something important to remember. It's normal for the lower ball joint stud to have some axial free play when there's no weight on the wheel. So don't replace a lower ball joint unless there is more than 50 thousandths of an inch free play. Okay, Tech, I won't make that mistake. Good. Now, here are a couple of tips on servicing rubber bushings. When assembling rubber bushings, it helps to lubricate them with clear water. But don't ever use any other lubricant. And when you install and tighten rubber bushed parts, be sure they're not improperly stressed. Tech's right, Chuck. For example, a steering idler arm bushing that's tightened in a stressed position can cause drift and unequal steering effort. It can also affect wheel returnability. I'll watch out for that. There's more to the subject of steering than just the linkage and front suspension. How about giving Chuck a few tips on servicing the steering gear? Glad to, Tech. For instance, on the manual steering gear, adjust worm-bearing preload before you adjust ball-nut gear mesh load. 
and always disconnect the steering gear arm. You don't want any outside drag on the gear when you're testing the torque to see if an adjustment is needed. Just remember, too much preload in the steering gear is apt to cause wander. So stick to the preload specifications. Don't over tighten. Matter of fact, excessive tightness, friction, or misalignment anywhere in the gear or in the steering linkage is apt to cause wander. And speaking of alignment, here's how the steering system should line up. With the steering wheel exactly halfway between its two extremes of travel, the wheel should be centered. The gear should be on its high spot. The front wheel should be straight ahead. Master splines at the steering wheel and at the coupling should be straight up in the 12 o'clock position. And the coupling clamp bolt should be inboard. Present couplings are made with a notch at the master splines. On early models, I marked the couplings to make it easier to line up the master splines. The steering shaft should be positioned to the center of its travel in the coupling. To see if it's set right, measure the distance from the coupling to the gauge point. If adjustment is needed, loosen the jacket clamp bolts and reposition the jacket. Also, the lower end of the jacket should be centered around the steering shaft. To adjust this, loosen the jacket clamp bolt and the tow board screws until they're only snug and move the jacket to a concentric position. Tighten the jacket clamp bolts first, then recheck concentricity before tightening the tow board screws. Why is this concentricity so important, Steve? Well, here are two good reasons, Chuck. If the steering shaft's not centered on a power steering car, it could cause poor returnability. And on a manual transmission job, it'll affect shift quality. And last but not least, when the steering wheel's centered, the gear's on its high spot, and everything else is lined up, the front wheels should be straight ahead. If they're not, adjust the tie rods to set them straight. Well, Chuck, I hate to say this, but that's about all the steering service information we've got time for right now. Okay. Thanks for those tips, Steve. Your explanation of steering geometry will come in handy in a lot of ways, too. Now I know why each front end specification is important, and it'll help me diagnose steering and handling complaints, too. It'll be easier to understand the suspension and steering geometry design of our future cars. And last but not least, it'll help me to be a hero with a kid brother, too. <laughs> that it will, Chuck. I'm sure your brother will see that there's a lot more to this service business than grease and grief. And the more complex cars get, the more opportunity there'll be for qualified service technicians. You know, there's something else we can all learn from Chuck's example. His desire to add to his service know-how is a big part of a professional approach that'll contribute to his success as a service technician. And it'll help build a better dealership, too.